Under One Roof, 10 Years of Studio Maylot, an anthology. The Girl, a Wolf, and the Eagle, by me, Joel Martin. The little girl ran as fast as her feet could carry her, because if she didn't, they would find the wolf and kill him. She was not as fast as Fionn or Aina, but she had to be fast now. The little girl had slipped past the patrols at first, but then, almost free of them, one had seen her. She might not have been the fastest, but she knew if her heart didn't burst from her chest, she would outrun the heavy man. The iron speckled sandals and the heavy iron armor would slow him. The little girl was at the trees now, and the flickering torchlight of the village was lost in a blur of leaves and bark. But she turned when she shouldn't have, and her skinny ankle caught on a root. She fell into the wet soil, her fingers curled into the leafy tangle, and she tried to push herself up. A spike of pain shot up through her leg, and she cried out. Tears stung her eyes, and she felt more anger at the tears than the pain. The man in the iron was nearly on her. He trampled the sticks and the leaves without a care, like all his brothers that marched under the eagle. She didn't want to look back at him. He would carry her back to the village, and there she wouldn't reach the wolf. A man might beat her for disobedience, but it wouldn't hurt more than knowing the gentle beast was dead because she failed. She kept her gaze to the trees and its comfortable darkness. Within it, she saw a flash of golden animal eyes staring back at her. Just when the panting man was nearly on her, she rolled and saw in his hands the short stabbing iron sword. Fear, cold and sharp, rushed through her but she did not have time to feel shame for it. When the creature leapt over her in a rush of grey and black shadow, she blinked, suddenly tired, and try as she might to resist it, the lids of her eyes drooped almost to closing. In the blur of her tired lids, she saw the grey creature swing glinting claws through brittle iron armour, and red mist spilled out of the man like wine, fleeing a spoilt wineskin. Then her eyes and ears dimmed into darkness and silence. When the little girl awoke in the dim blue darkness of twilight, she knew she was being carried. When her ma'am carried her, it had been the same hurried walk with the little girl tucked neatly in her ma'am's strong arms. Her ma'am also wore a fur shawl that felt just like the arms that now held her. That was before her ma'am had gotten sick, and her da had told the little girl she would not be carried any more. When she really awoke, when the thoughts were less muddled, and the girl could see more, she realized she was lying on the ground, looking up at a clear night sky. She sat up only a little groggy and rubbed at her eyes. She sat on dew-damp grass, and but a few steps in front of her, there was a pool of water that reflected the starlight. A form sat at the edge of the pool, silhouetted by the light. Its head was that of a wolf, and its long arms ended in mannish, fur-clad hands, tipped with sharp, silvern claws. Incongruously to the little girl, he held in his hands a curved fishing rod of simple make. A small wicker basket was to his left, and within it glinted two small fish. When the little girl had seen the wolf before, she had seen only a full basket, but never witnessed his craft, and her ma'am had never asked where they had come from when she had brought them home. She walked over and sat by the wolf. He sat quite still, even when she came and rested against his side. From the pale light she could just make out the wetness that clung to his side. She curled her fingers into his fur, and her hands came away red. The man's savage iron had cut into him. Tears stung her eyes, and she was not even aware when she had started weeping. Keeping the rod held firmly in his left, the wolf pulled the girl into the warmth of his fur. The rhythmic pulse of his strong heartbeat and the gentle growl beneath his lips calmed her. 
despair, he said in a half growl. He spoke gentler than her ma'am. You are all right now, little one. I came to warn you. She choked the words out in a subsiding sob. I heard the village meeting. Those men with the iron and the red shields with the eagles. All the words came in a rush now. They are clearing the groves and they are looking for you. They've heard the stories. They'll come soon. He growled again, low and gentle. Hush, little one. You will scare the fish. I'm sorry, she said softly. Dear one, the fish are easy in their nature. They will forgive. But the men of eagles take away all our stories. I have seen them, and even our warriors cower now. Their eagles glare down at us, and I'm scared we will never look up again. The wolf waited patiently. With a patience the little girl envied. She could never be a fisher. Not like her da or the dear wolf. He waited with hand on the rod and line, and the other around the little girl. She wondered if he could sense her doubt in the forgiveness of the fish or the strength of the fishing line. There was a tug on the rod, and the wolf pulled the line back and upward. Gently but firmly he pulled the fish up out of the water. Its fin splashed the calm surface in its ascent, and ripples danced across the midnight pool. He caught the fish in his powerful hands and pinched its neck. It lay still, and he placed it carefully in the wicker basket. One more should be enough for your ma'am. It will need to last her, you see. She pressed her hands into his fur, and sobs threatened to break through once more. But the beating of his heart that warm pulse that calmed her once did so again. Hush, he said. Do not cry for me, little girl. I merely go away. The land needs you. It has you, he said with a low growl. You have been here for the village always. My spirit and my stories lives on in you, little one. They cannot take that away. His warm hand curled tighter around her. The fear, the sadness, and the worry fled, albeit for only a few moments of blissful quiet. He whistled softly through his teeth and gently laid her hand upon the fishing rod. The wood was not coarse but well-worn. It was hard and strong, and she knew now how it could be held so firmly. It made her feel weak and small compared to him. The wolf helped her settle the end of the rod into the ground between her feet, and suddenly the weight was lighter and her arms could hold to it without trembling. The lion will help you, little one. My ma'am has forgotten it, even my da and all his friends in the village. When the men with the eagles came, they didn't fight, not like the other tribes. There is a virtue to peace, little one. But you fought. She did not want to look at the dried crimson at the tips of his claws, for she feared her grip on the fishing rod might slip. The time for my fight is ended, he said. His warm arm loosened around her a little, and her heart beat quicker, and the fear slipped back into her body. Don't go, she said. He squeezed her bony shoulders gently one last time and pulled away. Do not watch me go, little one, for your grip will slip, and the fish will not take to the bait. If you go, I cannot protect them all. You will feed them, little one. The land will teach you, and when you need to, and when you must, the land will help you fight. No eagle's talons will touch you then, little she-wolf. She did not watch him go, even though the tears slipped down familiar tear tracks but she would not fail him and let the rod slip. He padded away, softly. She was left alone, but not cold now. Through the supple but strong wood of the rod, there was a tug at the end of the line.